let's get started. Um, thank you very much indeed, everybody. And I uh, would like to introduce uh, our first uh, speakers uh, or speaker from uh, KU Leuven. And if you could introduce yourself, that would be really great. So it's Tula and Robert. Thank you very much indeed. Hello, everyone. Um, Tula, maybe you should start uh, yes. introducing yourself and okay, then uh, okay. I'll go second. Yes, then you'll take over. Hello, yes. everyone. My name is Tula Verhalle. I work at the Faculty of Medicine and my main job is to help education as I am a practical assistant. And this is why we are presenting you uh, this virtual app. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm also a practical assistant, but I specifically work for uh, also the Faculty of Medicine, but the Expertise Center of Education. Uh, so the specific things we do is really try to facilitate and look for opportunities to use extended reality um, in yeah, different parts of our education. Uh, and yeah, today we're going to introduce you to one of these applications um, that Tula also, as she already said, like worked on too. Um, so I think we can go immediately to the presentation now. Um, so yeah, it's uh, at the Faculty of Medicine, uh, we, as I already said, we have a, lot, a couple of applications uh, and this one is actually one of uh, the first ones uh, we made and uh, it uses 360 video uh, in a lab environment, but we'll go further into that later. So everyone can see my the presentation, right? Yes, perfect. There you go. Um, I'm quickly going to show you uh, a part of the application first. Uh, it's a Dutch application for so, but it doesn't really matter what gets set. It's more about like how what you have to imagine. The Welke reagens kan je toevoegen om na te gaan of er al dan niet reducerende suikers aanwezig zijn in een staal? Aisha, jij hebt de praktica precies heel erg goed voorbereid, maar ik ga eerst eens luisteren of niemand anders het antwoord weet. Ja, Robert. Benedict reagens, correct. En wat is het hoofdbestanddeel van Benedict reagens? Um, Benedict reagens bevat kopersulfaat. En kopersulfaat bevat koperionen die in alkalisch midden, in aanwezigheid van citraationen, in oplossing kunnen blijven. En die koper 2 plus ionen die gaan in aanwezigheid van reducerende suikers en warmte van het warm waterbad omgezet worden naar koper 1 plus ionen. Wat er dan gevormd wordt, is een onoplosbare neerslag van koperoxidule. Kan jij nog even aangeven wat het resultaat is van de Benedict-test, indien er reducerende suikers aanwezig zijn in een staal? Hetzelfde principe wordt toegepast, staat geïllustreerd op de poster aan de muur, bovenaan. Ik denk dat jullie nu kunnen starten met het protocol te volgen dat in de handleiding staat. There you go. So um, this was quickly, I'm going to pause it here. Um, so this is a small part that I recorded myself. So to be clear, this is a virtual reality application uh, that uses 360 video to show it. But we'll go, we'll go further into this. Uh, I think Tula, there you go. Um, I think the, Tula was there uh, at the beginning uh, of the, the project. I started working on it later uh, while it was already nearly finished. Um, so we'll, we'll have two, our two cents to say about this. So how was our startup possible? It was because of a, an EDL project that was organized from the KU Leuven Learning Lab, which is a, a central service at the KU Leuven. And they encourage all the faculties of our university to, uh, yeah, to do innovative digital learning projects. Um, and they are based on the optimal use of educational technology and this, they stress out the innovative forms of, of education. And we applied, uh, we submit our innovation 
innovative project Fiskilab, and we had the opportunity to uh, work it out as we were selected. We could go and start on the project funded by the K-Level Learning Lab, which was really nice. So the startup itself, uh, the first question, of course, is what do we need or what are we going to make? Um, and yeah, the, the answer was quickly an innovative educational tool, but this is such a vague term that of course uh, we have to specify. The main uh, difficulty about uh, getting an ID is the fact that we want to use the application for a large and uh, heterogeneous group of starters. Uh, this group is bigger than 400 students. Uh, so we really wanted to make something that could be used by all of them uh, and that, you know, that they, all would uh, yeah would be useful. Um, another thing was that it had it had to be in an authentic laboratory. Uh, so we wanted it to really look like uh, a, yeah, a laboratory that students would go into after they did this uh, practicum. Uh, and then the last thing is formative evaluation and feedback so that the students would actually learn something and not only learn something, but actually realize, okay, oh, I made a mistake. Uh, how can I fix this? Or what did I do wrong? Um, the specific learning objectives were, yeah, lab safety. So it's really the to make students uh, get at an equal start level. It's, it says there at the bottom of the slide. So make this big group of more than 400 students uh, have an equal starting level that when they go to a laboratory, they know exactly, like all of them know, okay, this is how you do correct waste management. Uh, this is yeah, how you do different small tests, uh, how do you do lab safety, that kind of stuff uh, was, was the main, main goal for this application. Uh, so how did we do this? You know, it, it, it's always very important and uh, we're at Kyle we we're very uh, strict about uh, when we want to make an application, we really want to look at what is the best option. Um, so we looked at other tools. Uh, we checked out collaborations with other universities, like maybe they have tools that we could use or we can work together on making them. Um, or they have like some other practical uh, things, courses, whatever. Uh, but in the end, we want to start looking at video, computer applications, virtual reality, 3D. You know, you have all these different options. Uh, but in the end, we uh, ended up with 360 video in VR. Uh, the reason I will come back to later. Um, yeah, so it's a, a, the, the application itself was based around a storyline. So we didn't want to give the students just an application with here are all kinds of videos uh, of, of lab safety or whatever uh, and, and figure out. We really wanted to invest these students into a story. So uh, yeah, a, fun, a kind of funny, interesting story, uh, a murder mystery was chosen uh, with different characters. Everyone in the classroom uh, has a role to play in the story. Uh, and yeah, you actually have to kind of find out who is guilty because someone tries to poison someone else. Uh, and through these tests you do in the laboratory during the storyline, you find out uh, who is guilty uh, scientifically then. So yeah, it's really to engage these students and to motivate them. Then uh, going back to the 360 video, um, of course, we at Kyle Leuven, you're at the Faculty of Medicine, we have the option to make application in 3D. Um, we, we have a team that works on this who knows how to do it, um, but there is a lot of advantages of using 360 video. Uh, and one of the advantages is, first of all, we want to do really make it immersive, um, but immersive in the way that it's actually these authentic laboratories from uh, that we have here. So the, the best way to do is to do this is with 360 video. Um, we did want to make it interactive, but this is absolutely possible, as you already saw in the video before. Uh, we have these different menus that come up. Students can choose stuff. Uh, it's quick. I put it uh, <laughs> like it's not quick to make, but it's quicker to make than, for example, a full 3D environment that has to be completely interactive uh, and it's easy in use. You know, you can give the students a headset, they start the application, and it, it figures itself out. Students don't have to learn too many controls to navigate the application. Uh, we, of course, had, uh, we have Limel here at uh, Kaerleuven, who is like, they're a professional uh, videographers and they have, like, they have a lot of uh, technical know-how. So we made 360, de uh, 360 uh, degree recordings with them. Um, it was then developed in-house um, in Unity. And yet yeah, it's all, as I said before, all in an interactive environment in this scenario. Um, as you could see before, it starts videos, it puts menus in between, it gives you extra information, it gives you questions, 
these things had to be programmed in. This was all done in Unity. And then uh, finally, we give this experience on an Oculus Quest 2. Um, the only bottleneck we found with this headset is that the quality of the video was too high to put on there. So we had to lower the quality a little bit from the camera that we actually used. Um, so as I said before, we have uh, interactive elements. You saw a, a couple of examples. After this, there will be another small video as you will see uh, some more examples. But this can go from posters, as you saw before, like these images who, that give in extra information. Uh, you have these multiple choice questions. You also saw an example of this. But sometimes we also give uh, actual videos that are implemented, for example, uh, using different machines or, or different tools in the laboratory uh, is used with these 2D, uh, 2D instructional videos. And then, of course, also hotspots. So, for example, uh, you're going to see an example of this in the next video. So. Oh, no. Ik heb Benedict Reagens gemorst. Um, ja, ik ga even hiernaast vragen wat ik moet doen. Um, ja, ik heb net Benedict Reagens gemorst. Weet jij hoe ik dat moet opkruisen? Oeps. As you can also see in the, in the video, I quickly want to pause it. Uh, didn't work too well. Uh, as you could see in the video, he, he actually, like, you get the feedback. So you answer the question. Uh, if it's correct, you, you get the feedback immediately um, with, you know, why it is the correct answer. If it's wrong, you get the, the feedback too, of course. So. Okay, thanks, Steve. In de volgende stap moeten we een halve milliliter van ons mysterieus melkstaal toevoegen aan het benedictriagens. We werken wel voorzichtig, zodat we niet morsen zoals Maxime daar. Hè? Over hier, uh, you can see the like Cluedo part, the, the mystery part. You, you see all the uh, you see all the different um, people, all the different students in the classroom, uh, and this is kind of like your experiment table where you can say, okay, these people are not guilty. These may be guilty or this, you know, this is what the, um, yeah, this is kind of the, 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 the image that you keep, that keeps popping up and you can follow who you already ruled out. Tillum, we mochten GSM helemaal niet gebruiken in het laboratorium. Zo krijgen we nog minpunten. Willem, je weet toch dat je in een labo geen GSM mag gebruiken. Je mag die enkel gebruiken tijdens een pauze in de schrijfruimte en let er dan op dat je je handschoenen uitdoet vooraleer je je GSM-toestel aanraakt, oké? Okay? Ja. Luna, ik zie dat jullie de uitgevlokte melk al aan het filteren zijn ja. door het gaasdoekje. En wat gaat er nu achterblijven op het gaasdoekje? Uh, ik weet het eigenlijk niet meer. Weet jij het nog? Wat heb ik toch geluk dat jij het practicum zo goed voorbereid hebt. Hè? So as you can see, um, there's a lot of interaction with the students. They have to answer questions the whole time, uh, but they also go through different stages in the laboratory. So the application actually starts outside, uh, outside of the laboratory. They they learn all these things that they normally would read, like okay, you can't use your phone in a laboratory. They learn this in a way that is more interactive, like they see someone else use their phone. Uh, and the like the 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 professor comes up to him and says, "Yeah, 
you can't use your phone for this, this, and this reason. Uh, so they learn it in a different way. Uh, here you have, for example, uh, yeah, selecting what machines you should use for different kind of tests. Okay. And now we will talk a bit more about how Visculab is integrated in our curriculum from biomedical sciences. As Robbe already told you, it's designed for over 400 students and it's situated in between two learning lines. So in the first semester, they already have a learning line methods where the students theoretically see which kind of methods are used in the lab to perform different experiments in our labs. And then in the second semester, they go through the Visculab app so they can really see what you saw already in, in the video that Robert showed. And that's, that is as a preparation for the learning line skills, where they actually go into the wet lab of the biomedical scientists and get to know how to use these techniques themselves. They, they experience how to use a pipette, what is a, a, a PCR machine doing, how to uh, centrifuge or how to vortex things. So they learn it really uh, themselves. And of course, um, after like making that, like making the application is one thing, uh, but integrating it actually in education uh, and or like saying, okay, we want to integrate this in there or like actually doing it is still a big step in between um, because just log uh, logistically, it's a big, big task. Um, first of all, we split the groups up. So instead of having 400 students at once, uh, having 400 uh, VR headsets, we split them up first uh, the last couple of years in 12 uh, students per group, which is still small. Now we're, we went to 24 students per group, which is still a lot. So like this whole month, uh, actually yesterday, the, 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 the like Fisikilab started, uh, the whole of February, like nearly every day, there will be uh, Fisikilab being teached to students. Um, but there is a couple of things that, that are uh, very important. So first of all, um, VR headsets, using them, you know, using a VR headset is something that a lot of students don't know how to do yet, um, which is important that we uh, introduce them to it in a proper way. So we have a how to work with a VR headset a video, basic thing that we show all our students uh, that just really goes through every step of the process. Um, we give e each student an individual VR headset. Um, and as to already said, it's always before their real life uh, practical. So they always do it uh, before, so they know how everything will look. Um, there you go. Logistically, I quickly want to say one more thing about it. Logistically, it's also things like okay, how do I how do we make sure that these uh, VR headsets gets uh, to these classrooms that they get charged? It's a it's a whole thing um, that you know took us a while to figure out, and we're still trying to figure it out. So there you go. So in the in the first year that we enrolled Visculab, it was 2021. We also did a small evaluation. So we split up our 374 students into two groups. We named them group A and group B. And then we designed several tests that we implement on different periods during the timeline of uh, their OPO. So OPO means the subjects that they are taught. So first, we had the, the pre-test, it's a test before the students actually got their uh, guidelines so they don't know anything about what will happen in, in the wet lab or what we expect them to do. Then we have a distinguishment between post-test one and post-test two. So only A, group A will have post-test one and that's a post-test in between the guidelines that the students receive on the learning platform and before they have to go through the Visculab app. Afterwards, both groups are having a post-test too before they enter to the wet lab, as I already said before. And after all the practical sessions in the real laboratory, they have a retention test. And why do we do that? Why do we split group A up in, in two post-tests? Because we want to see what the added value of Visculab is compared to the added value of the guidelines that the student receive before entering the, the practical 
sessions. What do we test? We test their knowledge, their attitudes, the motivation and experience. As uh, Robbe already mentioned, we have a large group of starters with very uh, heterogeneous backgrounds. And that's why we want to know what knowledge they have to start with and try to figure out a way, uh, a way out so that every student has the basic knowledge before they can start in the wet labs. And the test was performed on our learning environment Toledo. So the pre-test test their initial knowledge, motivation and expectations. Then we have the post-tests. They are testing the acquired knowledge after either the guidelines and or Viskilab up and the expect experiences of our students. In the end, we have the retention test to see what knowledge retains after the whole process and how had Fiskilab helped the students during the practical sessions in the lab. Now I will guide you through some questions to show you some differences. We have question A, B and C. And as you can see, we have three different colors. The darkest blue is the pre-test. The lighter blue represents post-test one and the yellow greenish is the post-test two. So in, in question one, we can see that the pretest and the post-test one are quite similar results in answering the questions, while the post-test two, after um, having the experience of Viskilab, we see that students has, has uh, answered the, the question more correctly compared to previous. In, in B, we see that it's, it's like a gradient that gradually grows. In the beginning, not all, not all the students have the knowledge, but after reading the guidelines, already more students capture some extra knowledge. And after they have the experience with Viskilab, we see an increase of the knowledge of on that specific questions. Here is it about CyberSafe. In, in question C, it's more a general line that you can see that means that either the guideline and or Viskilab do not have a really yeah, good effect on the knowledge for that question. And as we see what question we ask, we ask here, it's a relatively simple question. So I think this is already basic knowledge for most of the students before they read the guidelines or before they are entering uh, the wet lab. So this is the bit to distinguish between the different tests that we did. And of course, we also have the, the last part, which is more uh, questions about the application itself. We do this with all the applications we have. Um, and yeah, it's more of like the opinions of, of students themselves. So does it give me a better insight into subject matter, for example? A lot of students agree. It's, it, it, it's clear that at this point, the VR applications are still quite new. Uh, students are not too used to them yet. So that it really motivates them and really makes them interested in the topics, topics at hand. Um, you also have this kind of like VR related questions. So like how much experience do I have with VR applications? A lot of students didn't have any uh, uh, interaction with it. So I'll quickly go to the last part. So we're working on a 2.0 version, um, which is, yeah, I, I worked on it. It's mostly details. We're still changing, writing mistakes, style mistakes, color changes, that kind of stuff. Uh, and it's I separated them all into these different categories. We figured like we worked on this uh, and the new version should be out uh, very soon. Um, then the next step we still, there is a possibility that we still will expand this to uh, a 3.0 uh, because like mostly we would say, yeah, this is and like timeless, you can keep using this application forever, but you can already see in how people, for example, hairstyles or, or clothing styles in the beginning of the video, there is a big difference already. Um, and I can imagine that in five years, people will dress completely different uh, or maybe some small changes in how uh, like these, these skills get teached. So maybe then uh, there is a reason to make a new version. This is not something that is planned right now, uh, but it's as, uh, like, as it already states here too, it should be absolutely feasible to make it, for example, in English, uh, everything, we have everything saved so we can absolutely make new recordings and put them in an application. Um, 
yeah the last uh, the last uh, part i will quickly go through so the it's it is a time consuming project i said in the beginning that it's quick uh, that is true like the 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 technology we use is quick but to write down this whole uh, like this whole script you know right, think about the whole scenario big thing uh, we had to think about added value of VR, uh, you know, making this choice in a good way that it's not something that we shouldn't use. Um, you know, are there other uh, other things that are more uh, interesting to use? Um, we absolutely do use, um, like, we, we believe in the advantage of in-house knowledge and development, uh, because now we can easily make a second version or we can adapt uh, the version that we already have. Um, and yeah, it's very important that it's easy to access for every student so that, you know, why every student has, needs to have a VR headset, um, like that we have access to this and can easily give it to them. As you can see here on the on this slide, we were with a pretty big team. Uh, as I also said before, we switched around. So some people were like, for example, uh, there was someone before me who worked on the application first, and now I'm working on it. So there's a like it switches around a bit, but it's it's a big team. Uh, also, educational professionals. We have developers. We have people who know both. Uh, and, and last part, uh, as I said before, a lot of people worked on this. A lot of uh, Different, uh, yeah. So it's all the all the logos from the different uh, places that work on this. So uh, thank thank you very much, Robert and uh, Tula. That's very very interesting. Uh, also to see the new the new version when that comes out. Uh, you'll see there's a couple of questions in the chat, and I hope that you can just answer to those for of us while we, when we move to the next session. Um, you should be able to access it, uh, and if not, we'll come to those in the discussion, and then. Um, Dovi, who do we have coming up next? Have we got the same running order? Have we changed it around? Uh, we would like to invite Linda uh, We'd to, like to, to invite present. Linda. Brilliant. OK, so let's move to Linda. Thank you, Linda, for being flexible. We've got some uh, uh, technical challenges with Michigan, uh, so they'll, hopefully they'll be ready in, in half an hour. And uh, so thank you very much indeed, uh, Linda, if you'd like to share the screen and introduce yourself, and then we'll come we'll, uh come to your session, thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Linda van der Weg. I'm working at the University Library of the University of Amsterdam. And I would like to tell you about our hybrid learning space. Um, <clears throat> I cannot uh, show you uh, the hybrid learning space live. But we made a, a movie, and I'm going to show it to you after I uh, share my presentation with you. Thank you. Okay, so the University of Amsterdam has about uh, 41,000 students and um, I'm situated at the uh, central campus, uh, which has 2,640 study places. And we serve the faculties of social sciences, economics and law. And that is where we are situated. And that's also where this hybrid learning space is situated. Um, well, why did we uh, design a hybrid study room? Well, that's because we have a new humanities library, which is uh, now being built. It will be ready next year in 2025. And we wanted to experiment um, with different kind of furniture and purpose for the rooms. Um, and uh, so in 2019, we uh, actually finished this hybrid learning space in this building. But it's actually like an experiment for our uh, bigger uh, humanities library. Um, well, what is available over there is uh, two large screens. We have a lot of movable furniture. So tables uh, have wheels. Um, of course, the, the chairs have that as well. We have different kinds of chairs. We also have different heights of uh, tables. Um, we have a lot of um, uh, whiteboards. We have big ones, but also small ones that you can see on this uh, 
uh, picture. And they are very popular with the students. And we have a lot of uh, side screens, the, the yellow ones, and they are being used to create different uh, spaces in this one big uh, uh, space. And also there's a meeting aisle, um, for to borrow at the library desk. And this library desk is uh, on the same floor. So if you step out this hybrid space, it's only a few steps away uh, to the library desk. And uh, of course the librarians, they are av available for support uh, if you need any. So the meeting aisle is only uh, to borrow for teachers. So and to, because I, I totally skipped what's hybrid about this room, but it's, um, it's a study room, it's a study space, but it's also um, available for uh, lectures. So teachers can use this room they, they can make a reservation or um, uh, the schedulers can, can make a reservation for this room uh, for a lecture. So that's the, the hybrid part. I totally skipped it. And could you um, clarify what the meeting owl is? There was a question in the chat. Meeting owl. Oh, um, yeah. This is uh, a technique to... Uh, uh, wow, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, a camera. <laughs> it's a camera and, it, and it's uh, going around 360 and uh, the good thing is about it, it responds to sound so when you're in a meeting and uh, someone is talking the camera uh, goes to the person who is talking so when you are at home and not in the physical space uh, you will see who is talking it's, it's a very good uh, thing um so you will see in the movie you will see the meeting owl as well um <clears throat> all the tables have power sockets because you can never have enough power power sockets <laughs> uh the only thing is that the, because you can move the um, the tables it's uh it can be a hassle to uh, get the power sockets connected to the electricity again but if if you know how it works it's it's fine but that's the only difficult thing in moving all the furniture um and uh, students they use it uh, very much they turn it upside down this room they they Every morning we have to <laughs> put it all at the, uh, well, we, we try to keep the, the um, like the uh, same, uh, how do you call it, uh, design for uh, to start off every day. So we have to put it back, but uh, the students, they like to experiment with uh, tables over there and chairs there. It's, it works very good. Um, so how is it being used? Well, it's well used by students. Uh, it's one of the most popular study spaces of this building. Um, we, what we see is during exam time, it's mainly used for individual studying. So uh, students just um, uh, sit there in very high intense studying, although the chairs are not very, very good for high intense studying, but they still do this. Um, and outside the exam time, uh, it's being used for collaboration and they talk. It's not a silent place, so students um, uh, sit there and talk a lot and, well, experiment with stuff. So that's how it's being used. Um, and what we do is we offer teachers to uh, use it for lectures in the mornings from 9 till 11 and on Fridays all day because these are the times that it's not very um, uh, crowded for studying because students, they start a bit late. Uh, so, uh, but it's not, it's not a very big success yet. And that's because, um, well, actually when it was finished, COVID came and all the people that were working on it, they uh, left the organization. So I'm rather new to this place and uh, together with some colleagues, I've, I've tried to, uh, well, we try to make it more uh, known with teachers that they can uh, use this room because we know that teachers uh, very much would like to, uh, well, innovate their 
uh, education forms. So they would want to do more about active learning. And this room is very suitable for that, we believe. And that's what they told us as well when it was finished. But <laughs> they can't find it. They can't find how they can make a reservation for it. So it's in the uh, it's in the system now. It wasn't in the system, the, the normal schedulers or booking rooms uh, system, but now it is. So we do hope it will grow. Uh, also, we try to reach teachers uh, through our uh, teaching and learning centers to make it more um, well, to spread the word. Um, also, we think it's a smart use of square meters because here in Amsterdam, uh, square meters are expensive and scarce. So uh, we think it's uh, the best way uh, to use uh, a space hybrid. So if it's uh, if it's possible, we want spaces to be uh, highly adaptable. So you can use it as a lecture room or you can use it as a study room or maybe you can use it for an event for students so that's that's one of our takeaways takeaways uh, highly adaptable is a success you never have enough power sockets and communication is key we also notice well uh, power sockets we started with one power socket uh, for one study place but what we see is students need more they want one for their laptop. They want one for their um, um, for their telephone. They also want one for their electrical bike battery, <laughs> which is not allowed, by the way. Um, so you can never have enough uh, power sockets. Um, so well, I will show the movie. Just to stop sharing this one. Okay. My colleague will share the movie. Okay, you can see my new order. Okay, so this is where you come in, and on the doors it said uh, the many ways of how you can uh, rearrange the furniture. Uh, to the right, you will see the meeting aisle standing on the table. This is me um, working. I have the meeting aisle connected. These are the whiteboards that are very popular. And as you can see, two of them are gone missing because students love them that much. So uh, we have two big screens. You can rearrange the room and have two meetings with screens on the same time. The yellow um, room dividers you can see there are very helpful in dividing the room. It's not uh, people who are sitting there, are, they say it's very uh, good divided, so they don't disturb each other. Uh, also, we have the whiteboards again. Uh, as you can see, the power sockets on the table, now they are up, but the, you can put them down as well. And they are connected with the, yes, that one, <laughs> the cables. <laughs> but as you can see, well, if you rearrange it, you have to pull them out of uh, and then you have to put them together again it's not uh, it's something you mustn't forget uh, also there are very big windows who let in a lot of lights and it makes it very comfortable to study and to be around in the room um, oh yeah the meeting hour is now connected so you can see on the big screen it's a colleague who is well in the room as well Um, yeah, and if you look through the doors, uh, no, you can't see that anymore. I wanted to say that's where you see the library desk. And 
in the left corner of the room, we have a lot of extra, I, I'm not sure what the English word is, I thought it was knots, they were called knots. All this furniture is from a uh, steel case. I believe they call them nuts, but they are very uh, nice to have as well. Very easy to move around. No, it's not very noisy. I can see this uh, question. It's not noisy when uh, students are engaged in different activities. I think it's because uh, of the screens that divide the rooms and there isn't uh, they did something to the ceiling. I'm not quite sure what it was, but it, it doesn't make a lot of noise. It's very comfortable for listening. Why are the whiteboards so popular with students? That's a good one. <laughs> I really don't know. <laughs> I didn't ask, but um, we do see them a lot. And also we have a lot of other project rooms uh, on this floor as well in the library. Project rooms are also very popular and there we always have whiteboards uh, in them and uh, they write a lot on the whiteboards. Every morning we clean the whiteboards. It's, it's a low tech solution, which is very popular. That's all we know. And I, I'm not quite sure why the small ones are very popular. I don't have an answer to that. Um, so I think just checking, is there something else I wanted to say? Um, no, that's about it. So I, I had one question for you. Thank you very much for the tour. Um, I, somebody thinks, great, we love it. We're going to set it up and do the same thing. What, what advice would you give to somebody based on your experience, what you've learned, what should you definitely do? What should you not do? to set something up similar? Well, <clears throat> I would say you would have to uh, proactively uh, meet with uh, teachers from the start to let them help you think how they can use it and how the process must be when they want to use it. Because that's the one thing that is missing, I think, right now. So I would advise uh, everybody for that. So if I understand that you've got a new facility, students are using it quite a lot, teachers are struggling to find it or to get it booked, and then also quite how to use it. Are, are there some teachers who have been using it? And if so, what yes. types of lessons are they using for that? What are they doing in this space? Um, from what I've heard, because I wasn't there um, when they used it, but it's more the teachers from economics and business and they have to do more like practical stuff and in groups working in groups so the, the teacher gives the the students an assignment to do to work in groups and then he walks around like the way they do in primary school <laughs> here in the netherlands so um that's what i heard so it's more like uh, a working group they call it yeah. here yeah and uh, so it's for interactive um, space. So I'm immediately as a teacher, I'm thinking, I, you know, I want to come in there and tr try it out because it looks like this wonderful space. Um, how many students, just for a sense of the size of the space, how many students would there, would you be able to get in for an interactive class? 42. 42, okay. Yeah. Um, and at that point you also book it out. So the other students who would normally be in there, yeah, would not, uh, would not be well, allowed to yeah, use this, it. That yeah that's another thing we also said like if you have a small group the the, the system to make a reservation for a, a, a lecture doesn't say how how many students are in so we don't know how many students are coming in and if the if the um if the room is fully booked or if students can still come in because we said if if it's not full during a lecture other students should be able to come in and have and can work there as well. But that system doesn't work like that. So no, it's not perfect. So there needs to be a little bit of flexibility with the, the space, because obviously if the students really like to go there and want to study and there's another class going on in this room, then the idea yeah, exactly. is come on down. And um, Linda, I'm still, uh, I haven't seen the owl itself. 
but um, can you just walk me through again one more time? I've got a, I've got an each there's an owl on each desk, and then that's a camera that films me, so that somebody in another part of the room can see me. And and where do they see me? And how does that, that, that for me? I don't quite. Uh, I just would like a little bit more of an explanation on that. Yeah, a missing owl is just it's one camera. Yeah, there it is. So um, you put it in the middle, in the center right. of the group who has the meeting. And it's connected to the laptop. So, and the laptop is uh, in the meeting, like a Zoom meeting or a Teams meeting. So on the screen, you see the people who are um, on the big screen, the, the, the person, she's not in the room, but in the right corner at the bottom, you see the, the ones who are in the room. So the ones who are in the room, they are around the meeting hall. And if, the, if a person in the group, in the room, is talking, the camera is turning to the person who is speaking. Right. So then, so through this, you can uh, connect somebody who's outside in another space. Uh, you can yes. connect them back to, yeah, okay. Uh, and yeah. then they, they so the, they're able to interact with people who are in different locations in the room and the camera selects if they're talking it points them out okay so um, it's actually yeah. it's 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 the uh, it works very good for the person who is not physically in the room because then they can see the person who is talking in the room so you can also as a guest lecturer or an expert you can come in and then you can have a discussion with a bunch of people in the room yes um, and then if somebody speaks, then it will, the camera will go to them. So yes, that sounds, I'm going to have to get one of these. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's a very good, good item. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking here to see are there other questions um, and how we're doing uh, uh, with, with time. Dovi, where are we at with time? We've still got a, a few minutes. Should we uh, see if there's any other questions for Linda? Um, uh, I guess the question that's always up there is, is is cost, but to me it seems to be furniture and some room alterations. So I'm not sure uh, what what the investment is. Is it qu quite high? No, I, no, I, I can't. Okay. I really don't know. No. Yeah. Okay. But well, we that... we did it together with uh, that I can tell. Yeah. with steel case and they have in munich in germany they have a very big uh, place where you can see all their furniture and i do know that the pers persons here at the library who uh, designed the room they went to munich and together with steel case they picked these uh, furniture right that's what i do know very good uh, thank you for that explanation linda and i see from tula that uh KU Loven also uses these owls. So if, I guess if we're, there are those who know about the owls and those who don't. So I'm one of the who doesn't yet. So I'm going to have to get my hands on one and, and uh, try it out. So thank you for that overview. Um, great. Uh, I think we're, we're ready to go to the next session, but let's check whether our colleagues in, um, in Michigan are ready. Dovi, do you have a sense of where they're at? I see you nodding. I think there should be okay. Yes, Great. I see Jeremy. Uh, that's very good. Hi. Of you. Okay. Can you hear me? So, yeah, Jeremy, thanks so much for uh, setting up the technical, yeah. and uh, we can see an amazing screen here. So, without further ado, we'll uh, hand it over to you. And thanks again for being up early. We appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. So you can see me okay? Yep, we can see you. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? And okay, here, great. Here, okay. Uh, I'm Jeremy Nelson. Uh, I'm the senior director of Creative Studios here at the University of Michigan's uh, Center for Academic Innovation at the University of Michigan in the United States that works with uh, all 19 of our schools and colleges here in our university to help create a lot of their online courses, both uh, credit bearing and non credit bearing. Uh, over the last 11 years, we've created over 300 online courses through platforms like Coursera, edX and our own Michigan Online. And today I'm really excited to, to come to you live from our new XR studio that we built this last summer. So we are in our control room. This is a broadcast control room. Uh, you'll see here, so this was all custom built. The whole building was custom architect, at least these, these rooms that we're in. Uh, and so from this room, we can control our new LED stage or our virtual production stage. So down here, uh, we have our, kind of hard to see, but we have a whole lighting control system 
We have a, a DMX lighting grid in there that we can control and automate. You'll see a little bit of the automation when I show you as we go forward. Uh, we have a color correction monitor here. So here, uh, as many of you know, the camera can see different colors than our human eye. And so everything that gets rendered out, uh, final edits, we want to make sure the color correction is, is right from here. Uh, we have a, a full switching board so we can switch between different camera angles uh, and different media. This is Chamela, our virtual production producer. So he's been working uh, with us to get uh, many of these pieces set up this morning and a couple of technical difficulties. We have a workstation here where someone can plug their laptop in uh, and they can connect in and provide some video feed here. Um, we are using this software back here called Disguise. Uh, so this is based out of the UK. It's software used in the, in the new sphere in Las Vegas. It's used um, by a lot of the big concerts to basically render uh, out any video content to uh, projectors, LED screens, and we can tell it which, which uh, an image, a video, 360 video, uh, a real-time Unreal environment and scene. Uh, we have our Unreal Engine uh, workstation set up here so we can real-time uh, you know, render in uh, scenes. So we have a scene from an architecture project that we've worked on. And uh, we have a sound mixing board here so we can take up to eight channels uh, of audio. And so now I'm gonna move us into the studio. So this is our control room. So we're gonna walk through here. And we're gonna go into our XR studio. And so this was all custom designed and architected. We are actually in a building that is under a parking structure. So we have cars that drive over the top of us. Uh, so we had to do a lot of acoustical testing, some vibration testing to make sure there's no noise transfer uh, and vibration transfer. Thankfully, uh, there aren't any, um, which is great. Uh, so we worked with our architects to design this space. Uh, these LED panels that I'm going to show you in a little bit have a lot of heat they put out. So we had to upgrade the, the HVAC system. We had to put in large cooling uh, vents. So you see these large tubes here. Um, we needed a lot of cold air, but we needed it quiet so you don't hear it uh, when we're recording. We have these large vents here that blow cold air in and drop them out back here. So if you wanna come into the studio, uh, I'll show you a little bit around. We have four cameras that are set up. You see the LED screens behind us. So each of these cameras have a full tracking uh, solution on them. So these are red Komodo cameras. They have a tracking system on top that tell the system where the camera is in 3D space. So we kind of think about it like a GPS uh, for the room. So as I move this camera around, the in images that we'll show on the screen here uh, render from the proper perspective. So how they work is there are these dots on the ceiling. It might be hard to see, but all these little dots around, they're in a random order. Basically, this sensor on the top of the camera um, bounces off those sensors and basically tells the computer system where, where it is in space. Uh, so we have a camera here. We have a camera with a teleprompter over here. We have a jib. Uh, that we can get some interesting shots and we have a mounted camera up in the ceiling so we have four cameras that we can access from uh you might have noticed we had a piano over here on the side uh so we are doing a, a production um, where we can bring live props uh onto the set and, and give us a little bit of depth and perspective so we're storing the piano for now but now i'm going to walk on to the led stage and show you what this is so we have an led floor and uh, it might be hard to see there. So I'm going to turn this on. And so we have a full LED floor, uh, five walls that wrap around us here. And so this, there are about 187 of these panels. Uh, let us render different types of images, different types of footage. Um, and from here, if you can see, um, so this is what the, I'll stay in the light here. Uh, so this is one of the panels. They have uh, many, many different you know, pixels in them. There's different density of each of the panels, as you can see, and it's all computer chips. So they can pop in and out. Uh, we can replace any of them that have uh, problems or blown up pixels. I'll knock on wood. Luckily, we don't have any of those yet. Uh, but the floor is actually a different density uh, than the walls, because many times we're not filming the floor or it doesn't need to be high resolution uh, for the presenter. It's really for the presenter or the faculty to be standing here to know uh, what they're going through. Uh, the back wall is a 1.5 millimeter pixel pitch, which means we can get really close to the wall before we start to get a moray effect uh, in the camera. So, so the depth of what we can do on the stage, what we can show is, is gives us a lot more flexibility in that. We actually have a tablet here where I can control some of the timeline and scenes. So I can show different uh, scenes uh, here. So we're showing one of our holding scenes today. 
but I can pull up uh, a 360 video. And so this is a 360 video of uh, a beach scene. So I can see the floor and I can respond to it, right? So I don't want to get wet. Uh, I can jump off there. Um, depending on the, the need for the course, let's say we're doing a course on uh, climate change and rising sea levels, we could bring people into these environments uh, that we haven't before. We actually had some faculty in our School of Sci uh, <laughs> Sustainability uh, and Environment that actually went to Greece, uh, one of the islands in Greece this summer, and captured a lot of 360 footage. So we're talking with them about bringing that scene in here and then bringing the faculty to that space. Uh, some of the work we've done today, we have faculty in architecture um, that are built a VR application for construction architecture. So you see over here, um, this is our faculty where we've been recording him talking about some of the, the ways in which uh, materials, and in this case, wood, uh, how it's constructed, how to make plywood, how to make it fireproof safe, things like that. So we've filmed him on the stage inside of his VR environment, his Unreal environment, that now he can use in his class to describe the lecture and show the students what's happening. Uh, before they go into the, the lab. So we have a VR lab on campus that students can go into and try out this VR experience, but we can also use that material or that environment in another case. I'll show you another project that we're working on uh, here. It's called Black Performance as Social Protest. This is an online course we created about the history of uh, Black performance throughout the United States. Uh, and so they wanted, the faculty wanted to create uh, an experience, uh, kind of like a music video where they're moving through time from the 1800s through the early 1900s into the 1960s into 2020 uh, Black Lives Matter in DC. So we've been able to create, recreate these environments uh, from historical perspective and work with some of the students here on campus uh, to bring them into these environments and kind of start to create. So we're doing our final production uh, final filming of that in early April, uh, but here's some footage you can see of our test shot uh, on that. And then I wanted to show uh, another video of some of the things we've been able to do. So we're going to take over the whole screen here. Shamela can run that um, of our some of the work we've done. So this is a video of me standing inside of um, that architecture project. If you can hit play on that. I don't know if it's playing, Shamela. a little frozen. I don't know if you can hear me. Okay, so we're working through some of that. All right, so he play, hit play. There we go. So this is me on a stage, just like what I've been showing you, where I'm inside. And this was the proof of concept we used to help uh, decide to build this environment. So I'm standing inside of a full virtual reality project. I'm learning how to walk. I'm learning how to move around that space. You saw kind of silly, but I, I have the same iPad in my hand where I can move between those scenes within an unreal environment. So obviously this isn't a, uh, a place that actually exists. Uh, I have a tracker so we can actually interact with 3D objects and have them track to a sensor so I can move them around. There's a little bit of a latency there. So you have to be, you have to practice a little bit so you're not whipping it around too fast. Um, one of the nice things about this is you can actually, as the faculty or as the presenter, you can interact, uh, you can see what's happening. So you can interact more naturally uh, with the environment. So uh, there isn't, you know, uh, a lot of post-production editing that somebody has to do um, to make sure that you're looking in the right place um, around that. And so I don't know if he has another video you can show, Jamila. There we go. So this is some of the video of the construction of it. We started building this in July of last summer, and it took about a month and a half. Um, so we did a time-lapse video here of all the testing and all the setup. Uh, sorry for the strobing effect there, if it causes any <laughs> seizures for folks. Um, but this was over from July, and then we got full commission handover of the environment uh, in early September and started training with that. And so what we've been doing now is working with faculty uh, here at the university. So we source a lot of courses. Um, if you wouldn't mind coming back to, to my footage, uh, Tramila, that'd be great. Um, we work with faculty, thank you, uh, 
and help them take their course or idea for a course on campus and reimagine it for an online audience. So we don't just go into the classroom and film them. As many of you know, working on these massive open online courses or these hybrid degree programs, uh, we work with them to design. So one of the things we've been uh, working through is, is trying to figure out what is the workflow for us as we build these environments, interact with these screens. And so uh, we've got three courses right now that we're working on. One is called Building Community Value. This is with uh, faculty that teach about real estate and communities like in Detroit uh, in the United States. We're helping the community kind of rehab and build back and, and buy back their uh, environment. So we're going to have some scenes where we're in these uh, city blocks before and after renovations have happened. So we'll be able to bring them into that environment here. Uh, we have another course called um, Leading a Life with Dignity and Human Connection, uh, where it's all about um, meditation and psychology. And so we're going to immerse the faculty in some of these uh, environments where it can help the learners kind of get into a more meditative, like calming state. So we'll use some interesting environments. We're integrating some AI into that to create these environments, to create these videos. Uh, background videos. And then uh, the, the last one we're using to help us figure this out is called 3D printing with metals. And so this is a faculty in engineering that 3D prints metals. And so we're kind of some of these spaces are really hard to film in, really hard to get inside of. And so we'll be able to go capture those scenes and kind of bring them here, or we can bring a 3D model onto the scene where the faculty can talk about it. So it'll be a combination of doing some of the videos here on the stage. And then we're also integrating uh, mobile augment augmented reality into that experience. So the learner will be able to 3D print uh, something uh, on their phone and they can see uh, some of the challenges with that, where some of the stresses are and they can have a more interactive experience. Yeah, so we've just been really excited to, to build this, to figure out how our team works with this. I've had a great crew with me this morning. Uh, Eric and Sean have been helping uh, operate the cameras and make sure everything runs smoothly. And Chamela has been furiously running around behind uh, to make sure everything's running well. So it looks great for you. So yeah, I just really appreciate the time. Thanks for being flexible and, and moving us around um, some of these systems. Need a little bit of time to wake up in the morning. So uh, thank, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks so much for that overview. You can hear me. Okay. Yes. I can Fantastic. hear you. Great. Oops, a couple of there. questions coming in. Um, the yeah, first yeah. one was about, um, it's sort of to do with the the teacher learning to teach and interact yeah. in this space. Yep. The first question from Tula was, is, is it hard to move in the space? And then Monica added, yeah, how do you sort of need to practice to become fluent and confident <laughs> in that yes. space? Yeah, so some of it, like, if I, I look over here, right, I can see this screen, so I'm pointing at it. So um, that's not too bad, right? I'm more natural to move around. We have a tracking system, so I have a little sensor right here. So as I move around, the lights will follow me and stay with me. Um, and so you just kind of, we have a monitor right over there that I'm looking at that I can see myself. So there's a little bit of kind of reverse perspective in my head. So I got to know, I got to stand maybe right here. Maybe I'll have a mark on the ground. We can do things where we light up the floor, but since you see the floor, I don't want to light up a square there. Um, so I have some marks down here. So it does take a little bit of practice. And so that's what we're trying to understand uh, with some of these early courses of how much time is it going to take for the faculty. So this architecture faculty, they are great. They already know 3D space and how to move around, but we've had a few test sessions with them to get a sense of like, as he was moving around that object right there, it took a little bit if he moved it too fast. Um, so depending what the design element is in the course, um, it will take a, a practice session or two. And so we're really trying to figure out what, um, what is the added uh, pedagogical value to some of this? And what does it make sense in terms of like how, uh, how much effort and how much practice time needs to happen for the faculty? Yeah, it's a very interesting, Jeremy, when you talk about um, uh, the pedagogical value, maybe we'll come to that. Um, uh, before we get to that, yeah. I just had a question on uh, from Fleur in, uh, in Amsterdam about the amount of time it takes to make one of these new settings for a new lecture. You know, for the lecturer to make the course, yes. and if, what's the what's the timeline on that? Yeah. So if you think about normal video production, if you did green screen, I, we kind of think about this as like green screen on steroids, right? And so if you were to do green screen, you know, you have to like, you know, film them, make sure the lighting's right, make sure they're looking in the right place, and then spend a bunch of time in post production. So 
Uh, if it's just a background, uh, we've been able to turn that around pretty quickly. Like if I bring up the this this scene, like we were able to download and find this 360 video or just a video actually of the beach. Um, and so this is pretty fast to do. I would say, you know, we can do it in a couple hours max. The what takes a lot of time is the lighting because you want to light the the presenter for the environment. I'm not really lit well for this type of environment, right? It looks obviously it looks fake. Um, maybe it'll always look fake, but the, we try to make sure the lighting looks a little more natural to the environment. So that we're finding that takes a bit more time. If it's a full 3D environment, um, that does take quite a bit of time. We do have a, a 3D artist uh, on our team. We have two Unreal developers that have been building mostly VR experiences. And so now we're pointing them at building these environments, building these scenes. We have a great architecture school here. We've, we brought a class through um, and all 40 students raised their hand and said, can I come work here? Uh, so we've hired four of them and they're working through different uh, different projects right now. We're, we're creating some digital twins of part of campus. Um, we're out LIDAR scanning one of our theaters. We have a theater course that wants to kind of bring the faculty into these parts of the theater that, they, that you couldn't normally go like up in the up in the catwalk area or kind of backstage in certain places. Um, so we're still figuring out that does take a lot more time to build that full 3D environment. Um, and we do have a student right now that's kind of helping us build like a set. If you think about these, you know, Sky Sports or ESPN or these sports shows, they're doing a lot of this work now. And so we're, we're working on building a, a standard set that we could use for different courses a little bit easier. And this is, there's also a learning curve then for you guys. Uh... Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I got How a many people does it take to operate? Yeah. Cameras? Yeah. Things like that. I got a couple more questions coming in from Monica in Leiden. Uh, do you think that teachers sure. are more are more comfortable in being in this environment? Because obviously you don't have your students there, but you know, are they more comfortable in this environment? Are they more comfortable? Some of them are. Um, we we and you may all experience this too. Some faculty just aren't still aren't used to teaching to the camera, right? They don't get the response. They don't get the the nodding. Um, and so I, I don't know if we have enough data yet to see if this, but this kind of feels more like you're up on stage, right? You're up in front of the class. Um, we're toying with some ideas of maybe having some virtual metahumans kind of nodding along to the faculty. I don't know. We'll see if that distracts folks or not. I had another monitor up here that was showing my feed and it was glitching a little bit. So I had to turn that off because I kept getting distracted, seeing myself not move naturally. So um, I think some will do more better than others. So these faculty over here, these are our uh, voice and theater faculty. And so they're much more comfortable. All the students are, you know, uh, performance students. So we're testing out with them. Uh, what are some of these challenges or uh, opportunities? Fantastic. I see. Uh, uh, I see two questions. They're sort of overlapping a little bit from Tula in Leuven and Rebecca in Manchester. Yeah. Um, one is about, you know, is the room already well known? Is it being used a lot? And the other one is, you know, how do you promote this space within the university? So you, <laughs> how do you, a little bit like what yeah. we have with Linda in Amsterdam about, do people know it's there and how do they, uh, how do they find it and book it? Sure. Yeah, yeah. So it's always a, it's always an ongoing thing for us to kind of market, describe our services. We held a bunch of open houses last fall when we moved in. So we renovated an entire building about 47,000 square feet. I don't know if I'm to calculate that into meters. Um, but uh, so we have about 110 people on our, our larger team. And so we held a number of open houses. We renovated the entire building. We built six studios. So this is one of six. Um, it's not really open for just anybody at the university to come use it and book it. Um, it has to be within uh, one of the courses that we've uh, funded. So we have a a model where faculty pitch us on ideas and then we fund those projects. And so once you've gotten into our funding cycle where we've approved your course, we thought about, you know, you have to list what are your learning goals and objectives? How is this differentiating? You know, what is the, the impact this could have? How can this support pedagogy? So there's a whole process that faculty have to fill out before they engage with us. And so now we're starting to think about, you know, if it's a full course, you know, that course may have 15 to 20 hours of video content, a 12 week course. We're not gonna film all of that here, uh, but where in the course design does this make sense? So I, uh, we had just launched a course called Rocket Science for Everyone. Um, and unfortunately our studio wasn't ready, but we had been talking through ideas 
uh, we might do in an iteration of placing the faculty in the rocket, placing them in orbit. But where in that course design does that make sense to show that? Um, and where do we just need to practice to get better? I, I love these yeah. ideas. I don't know if I completely it's, answered the question. No, but no you yeah. did because it, it, it's. Uh, I think there's two things. One is there's this uh, sort of protocol. Obviously, the time, the space, and the the engineers and the camera crew, you need to make sure it's approved uh, because you can't just just walk right. in and use it. So, that those those criteria right. for the program and at what point that's a very. I don't know if that document is is public, but it, it would be interesting to know what some of the criteria are before you say, okay, you get the green light. So that's um, that that's yeah. One we question. have they're public. I mean, our yeah. Our calls for proposal, I can share that link with with folks, like how do we evaluate? And we just did a, sometimes we do more targeted calls. So we just did a, a call for short form generative AI content. Right. So we actually got massive response. We're creating 36 of these short form courses. So they're two to four hours in length, but incorporating uh, generative AI into our law school, into our business school, into some of the um, anthropology. So we're getting a lot of folks that hadn't engaged with us before which is pretty exciting so that so that will be yeah that will be interesting to see um the call for proposals i know there's a lot of people here who are supporting if we look at the poll from the beginning who are supporting the facilitating of these spaces i'm sure they would be interested to see that um sure. <laughs> the the other aspect i noticed is i just i'm just smiling the whole time i'm like this is so much fun, you know. Yeah, it's so it's good. Really amazing. You yeah, know, it's yeah. so good that there's there's this sort of creative energy, and you're like, how crazy can we go? And and it goes from very sort of formal, static, uh, one directional videos to a sense of like learning can be fun again. Is 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 that how you see it, or what's your yeah. thought on that? I think so. I think so. I mean, we've been doing a lot of like showing people what's possible and then getting them to think because they don't, you know. They don't know what's possible. We don't really know what's possible. We actually had that architecture faculty um, push us on a few things. He wanted to do this like kind of forced perspective look. And we're like, we don't think that's going to work. And then he's like, let's try it. And so we had a willing partner uh, in him to kind of try this out. And his team did all the building of the 3D environments and models. So that helped us kind of iterate quicker. Yeah, I can see we got uh, a lot of interest yeah. from our development fundraising groups on campus to kind of come here and, and do fundraising. So we're, we're, we're exploring that. We're, we're mostly focused on teaching and learning. Um, so we want to balance that. Uh, but make, you know, make this technology available to the folks. We have a lot of students. Actually, we're hiring a lot of students in to help us uh, with the production, learn the different pipelines. And so giving them opportunity to access, you know, something that's you know, maybe they'd only get in Hollywood or somewhere like that. Yeah, so that uh, it was it was a question. Uh, I, I see we uh, people are just responding very positively, uh, Jeremy. You can't see that, but there's people are thanking you for sharing it and <laughs> inspiration. Yeah, um, of course. When, sure. Um, the pedagogical value, because this is all really fantastic. These are all the bells and whistles, and I yeah. think most people watching in today are like, "Wow, you know, we'd love to ha we'd love to test drive in this space, <laughs> and we'd love to have this." We realize sure. it's not, not not everybody can have a facility like this. Um, how do yeah. you need to be accountable back to your board for the sort of uh, investment, the return on investment? What sort of things are they expecting to get back? Uh... Yeah, I think, I mean, one, like the, the faculty engagement, like how is this adding to the length of the course production? You know, we produce between... 30 and 50 online courses a year. So we do a lot of production here. Um, I think, is it adding to the quality? We want to start to do some testing um, and, and studying um, like the impact. We could do some A-B uh, testing here to see, does that have an impact of retention and you know, learner value? There's a there's a stronger push to, to create um, online degree content, so more credit bearing. Um, a lot of the, what we create is in the open space uh, in the MOOC space. So um, metrics we're looking at is like, how long is this adding to our production time? Uh, what's the faculty experience? How many more staff does it take to operate, uh, this? And, you know, are we able to create content we couldn't do before? Could we take someone to Greenland? Could we bring them over? You know, I took, uh, I took some footage on my phone at, at, at a, a sporting event. Could we bring things like that? People are not outsourcing content, uh, when they're taking these on location shoots. We'll see. Um, it's not as simple as just, you know, giving somebody a camera and hoping they come back with good footage, but 
I uh, think we can start to democratize a little bit of that. Yeah, I think um, that there's there's so it's different layers of complexity from the from the you know how you're going to get the most uh, the, the clearest video, the clearest message, the clearest pedagogy right. with how many people. Right. So there's multiple multiple factors that that come into play, and uh, of course it's a huge in, initial investment. Hopefully yes. you guys yes. can run it for <laughs> for a long time and get uh, yes. get enormous value out of it. So. Um, well, that's our that's our goal. One of the things we yep. want to explore, and, and Monica and I have talked about it, is we can set up where I could beam somebody in to the stage here with me. So yep. if they're on the, a remote end with a green screen, we can beam them in, and so the view that you're looking at looks like we're standing next to each other talking. Right. She, she wouldn't have any depth, but we wouldn't hand around her. But so that's that's a future, perhaps maybe in the fall or later, uh, a follow up we could do. Yeah. Uh, type of experiment with the group here, if there's interest. Yeah, fantastic. But well, for, thank for you. us, yeah. Yeah. we can bring in remote, you know, participants into our course that maybe we couldn't fly out here or couldn't get footage. So for the pedagogy, I think we can bring in experts in a way that we couldn't before. Yeah, and it's in a and it's in a very synchronous di dialogue, so it's sort of real time, right. and it. Uh, yeah. Fantastic. I I can see we're going. I'm just looking at the timing now because uh, we have until yep. uh, three thirty. Is that right, Dovi? Um, so we've got another ten minutes, and maybe yes, we can go to a general discussion because I'd love to hear from our colleagues in Leuven or in Amsterdam or other people on the um, in the group. You know, what are your thoughts about this? And feel free to put your microphone on and or just just come on in with uh, how would you how might you use it? What potential do you see? Uh, yes, so maybe I can start because um, I hope there is not too much uh, background sound. Um, but so uh, what we we are already looking into, of course, not uh, the the completely finished fancy studio, which is very impressive, uh, Jeremy. Um, but we are looking a little bit into virtual production too, um, using just a, a green screen. Uh, I think yeah. the 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 first thing is already just to what you also did with uh, our architecture three uh, D uh, environment. You know, putting our ourselves into our environments that we're making to present them uh, you know to the outside yeah. world you know because showing off a VR application is quite hard sometimes yeah. I have a feeling and I think virtual production yeah. could really help with this but of course um, like we want to experiment start experimenting with this but then in the future go to you know as as, uh, as you talked about too you know uh, putting uh, uh, professors into their environments trying to like give them extra yeah. ways to show their their yeah what they want to educate uh, it's the same the same way i think uh, as what you described before yeah i mean you you don't need a as large of a stage here you can do just a wall i mean there's some videos now unreal engine's got a lot of free assets you can mm -hmm. use an iphone and a big led tv um, and so there's ways to get started or green screen. So there's ways to get started and get comfortable with uh, some of these fundamental technologies to then determine, do you need something this large or different size? Um, I, I think yes, the... I do see the message about the disguise is it is very expensive. Um, but it'll, that media server allows us to just quickly bring in different images, backgrounds, um, kind of roll through that. And so. I think, Jeremy, one of the things that is very impressive about uh, your studio, which is, uh, I think, a, a real advantage to the other studios we've seen, uh, is the fact that you have a, a part of the floor, too. Um, I think that's a, a big yeah. deal. Because um, we, we've seen a lot of studios that say, like, yeah, we can't really do virtual production in here because we don't have a floor or we have to bring in, like, right. I don't know how many kilos of sand that they have to bring in to, like, fill in the <laughs> desert or sure, whatever. Sure. You know, so I think it's very, yeah, that's something very impressive. Brilliant. Thank you for that uh, feedback, Robert. And I don't know if our colleagues from uh, from the University of Amsterdam, Linda or Fleur, if you want to comment on what you've seen or comment on how it makes you reflect on the spaces you have and uh, different overlaps there might be. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Just uh, trying to... Uh... <laughs> make the audio work here um yeah i really love what uh what they have uh, in michigan also um uh, i think it would be a dream for many lecturers to uh, play around with it um but i also see that it it's uh, often very hard to think about uh didactical um uh, uh, yeah uh, design uh, that really works um 
within the course that they make. We uh, have um, a campus university, so we also have some, uh, uh, yeah, uh, a lot of lecturers who don't really like to go online, so they really like to lecture in a large right, lecture right. hall. Um, and also, yeah, maybe a, a small fear for if we if we make online too attractive, then <laughs> why <laughs> are they still coming to campus? Um, sure, sure. Uh, so for us, there is not so much um, uh, development in the online part. Uh, as we do have a few MOOCs. Uh, so I, I think that for these... Uh, um, yeah, th these type of videos that there there's a bit more uh, uh, budget for videos and uh, making online environments. Um, so <laughs> I'm not sure if I sure if I could get a board uh, <laughs> convinced that we, <laughs> we needed we need something like this too. <laughs> yeah, you can start smaller um just with the background so yeah and it, I'm, I'm thinking of the three different things we've seen uh which is like a learning space with the the university of amsterdam with the owls and then the virtual um laboratory with a sort of multiple choice quiz and training and then you've got this so i challenge us all here to think how can we combine those three for like the next level of uh because I think there are certain overlaps between them. They're not all the same physical spaces. Some are virtual, some are combined. Um, but in what ways can we take sort of the best parts of each of these uh, technology-rich learning spaces and, and, and get the most out of them together? I'm just wondering. I mean, the first thing I think about is uh, like combining augmented reality with spaces like the 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 like this this virtual production stage. You know, if you combine this type of technology with each other, I think you could make some amazing things. Like uh, we at the Faculty of Medicine are like already thinking about uh, yeah, like how do you work together with, for example, different uh, staff like med uh, medical staff. You know, so you have a, a doctor, uh, nurses. You know making them work together in a space that works in you know that uses specific technology to let them operate on a patient or or you know like this kind of working together i think that would be great for using in a space like this that combines these different technologies so it's collaborations across time and space um fantastic i'm looking at the yeah. time guys uh, we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up on time dovi uh, before we wrap it up um just please give us some feedback in the chat what was most uh uh interesting what stood out what ideas have you got from today's session that will be really good to get some just provisional feedback from you guys just take a moment for that and um uh, before we get to the wrap up from from dovi i would just like to really thank our, our presenters very much the guys the whole team in michigan for getting up early managing to break the bandwidth somehow and get your servers and your machines up and running. We're really glad it happened uh, to our colleagues in Amsterdam and also in Tolovan uh, for sharing very different perspectives. But I think in the middle, there's quite some overlap. So um, really appreciate your time and input and uh, we'll...